mind is set, my grind is set, my heart on ice is cool. I'm only here to even a stove, whoa. My mind is set, my grind is set, my heart on ice is cool. I'm down right now, but did it before, whoa. See from here we gone up, made the call, I shown up. Now the game is sold up, say my name is blown up. We up, we up, we up. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Knighted Ones podcast, episode number 49. I got it right this week. Last week, I totally messed that up. As a reminder, we are the only podcast that features a former UCF national champion, a former UCF radio host, an ESPN analyst and hoops player, an infamous rapper that's infamous, our resident influencer and IG star, shooting the breeze, talking UCF sports, and remember to like Follow, subscribe, our YouTube, IG, uh, X, and everything else, and check out the 70-plus teams and conferences on the college huddle, of which we are a member. Exciting times, folks. Uh, Today was a big day. Tonight is Monday. We're recording Monday, the 29th of July, and that means camp has opened. Fall camp has opened, folks, and um, that means we're starting to get lots of video of guys throwing the ball stretching, and that's about it. But uh, this is the beginning of the season. We heard from Gus Melzon this week, so we'll be talking about that. We've got some exciting recruiting news uh, about a certain someone named Jamarian Gordon. Uh, We've got a UCF legend coming back to the UCF Knights. That's new news for today. Um, We've got some new team captains to talk about, Um, and we've got that presser as well as some questions on what we're looking for on offense, defense, and special teams when it comes to preseason camp. So without further ado, we've got a full uh, full show for you this week. Unfortunately, we don't have a full cast, but we do have Nobra. <laughs> hey, now. <laughs> hey, now. Dude, I, I laid that up for you. <laughs> I forgot what There's my mind was for a second. Did, did I surprise you? I mean, I totally laid that kind out of, for you. Yeah, I was still updating the banners. <laughs> <laughs> Man, our production quality is aces, as uh, George O'Leary used to say. But he he kind of did the hair flip for us. Do us do it for the show one more time. There you go. All right, love the hair flip. Thank you uh, for joining us again this week. We did not have to do the show, start the show four times, and I got the right number, so I think we're already winning. Uh, next to the stage, we're going to add Alan Levin. Welcome back to the show this week, Alan. Hey, hey, that was a, uh, I thought that entrance by no bra was awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he just, he was like, if you're watching on YouTube, he was like, uh, what? <laughs> it worked. <laughs> it totally worked. So, uh, Alan, uh, why don't you give us a hair flip again this week? <laughs> uh, you, you, oh my gosh that. you wa- uh, that's a waggle that's not even a flip it didn't i got move. lazy what can i say you, you totally got lazy all right as a reminder folks alan levin has told us that he will cut his hair uh if we get to a thousand subscribers so make sure you're telling your friends uh about the greatness that is ucf show the hair flips and everything in between Unfortunately, the rest of the guys won't be here this week. However, we do get most of them back next week in time to start our march towards the season. Uh, but this week, let's talk a little recruiting, uh, a late ad, Jamarian Gordon. Uh, Alan, why don't you tell us a little bit about Jamarian? Yeah, so uh, big pickup for UCF 2026 class, uh, second overall recruit in the class. And actually, he is teammates with the first commit of the class, which is which was wide receiver Keon Chapman. They are both fellow Alabama natives, uh, both play at Jackson High School together there in Jackson, Alabama. So interesting enough, the first two commits of the class are from Alabama. No Florida guys yet, but obviously both players are very, very talented. And obviously Gordon, he's a four-star safety uh, who's essentially – 
been recruited by the entire SEC. If you look at his offers, it's like, uh, what was it, 20 or 21, I believe, um, or sorry, excuse me, 17 power four offers. And I would say over half that is the SEC. It's pretty much like the SEC uh, and a few other schools like Michigan and Oregon and, you know, things like that. But he's got an offer from Alabama, Auburn, LSU, Georgia, Ole Miss. Um, so he's really uh, someone that's uh, obviously in the national spotlight. He's actually ranked as the number 10 player in the state of Alabama, um, the number 20 safety, and he's in the top 220 nationally. So really good start uh, for the 2026 class. Um, he had a pretty strong sophomore year there at Jackson where he had 30 tackles, two tackles for loss, a sack, uh, a pick, and then seven pass breakups. So uh, nice pickup for, for UCF's 2026 class. Obviously, we're still really far out from, um, you know, those guys putting pen to paper. But, um, you know, hey, I guess we're getting an Alabama pipeline going. And of well, course, finally... Yeah, I would be remiss if I didn't say the big news of out of all this was saving for last is that we flipped him from the University of Alabama. So yeah. that might be the first time that's ever happened in school history to flip someone from Alabama. And I'm not talking about a transfer. I'm talking about a high school commit uh, that we're able to flip from Alabama. And not only that, an Alabama native. So not some kid that's from Orlando that chose Alabama and then decided to stay home. No, we flipped a local Alabama kid who was slated to go there. And even bigger than all that. And that's huge, by the way, so huge that uh, there was a viral video that was going around from an ESPN station where they spent literally, it was like four and a half or five minutes, uh, talking about this uh, and how this Alabama commit came to us over not just the Florida schools, but also came from uh, over Alabama. And they they were just roasting uh, Alabama. Alabama fans have been up in arms all week over this one. And here's the crazy thing. Um, not only do we have both of them, but there is a third player that we are after from that school. The and Jackson that's the quarterback, <laughs> right? Uh, that's a quarterback, and um, that's Landon Duckworth. And uh, Duckworth is a very highly rated, one of the top quarterback recruits for the 2026 class. He was just on campus last week. It was huge, huge, huge news. He's got a ton of offers everywhere and maybe the future for UCF football. They uh, All three guys had said that they wanted to continue to play together outside of high school. Now, obviously, with NIL is what it is. Uh, but UCF is is at a point where for certain players, we can compete at that kind of level. Um, you know, and that's that's all of our kingdom NIL contributions. But if we get all three of those guys, that would be a huge because he's even more highly ranked than what Gordon is. That would be a huge, huge, huge haul uh, for UCF out of the state of Alabama and cannot understate how big it is that not only are we being I, I remember it wasn't too long ago. We were fighting with Georgia Tech uh, or, you know, Louisville or someone like this. But every single player that we're going after, they've all got offers from ba Bama, Auburn, Georgia, Tennessee, Florida, and, and we won. So 2026 is a long way off. A lot of things could happen, but it looks good uh, for UCF and Alabama recruiting. And that could be the, the, the break of the dam for recruits that are coming from the state of Alabama. Gus has done a great job with transfers from Alabama recruits, but this is the first group of players that have come directly as freshmen, especially highly rated freshmen from the state of Alabama. So this is good news and shows that, um, you know, a lot of people are saying, and, and I believe this to be true too, 2026 is going to be an even more successful year than what 2025 was. And 2025 was the greatest year in UCF recruiting football history. And 2024 was that before then. So it's just continuing to build. Uh, and and Gus is cooking when it comes to uh, recruiting. So um, all good. Excited to have him. Um, can't wait to see what he does this season because uh, his, his numbers, his ratings might go up. His offers might go up. But this kid as a 2026 recruit is number 217 nationally. Um, and Duckworth is a top 150 recruit. So very exciting stuff. Um, 
So we talked about one boom. Let's talk about another boom, but a different kind of boom. UCF legend Sean Becton is returning to UCF stat, uh, staff as an analyst. Now, some of you will remember Sean Becton from his days uh, with George O'Leary. He is a UCF Hall of Famer. Uh, he was he left UCF to go and follow uh, Scott Frost. Sean wanted to be the head coach at UCF. He wasn't going to be given that opportunity. And uh, he made a heck of a lot more money at Nebraska than he would have at UCF. So don't begrudge him for that. This will be his 20th year uh, at UCF. Now, his position will be an analyst, which means he will not be able to coach players, but it will mean that he'll be involved with recruiting. And Sean Becton is very, very well known and a great recruiter, has, has pulled in most of the, the really, really top level talent that we've had at each step of the way over those 20 years. So that's going to be great. And I think once he gets to know Gus a little bit, um, I think that will also turn into a coaching uh, position. He was the guy who coached up all of the wide receivers for us, all of the famous wide receivers, uh, Brashad Perriman, um, you know, everybody going back to when he started playing and he's beloved by the team. Trey will be able to uh, mention some things about him when he's back next week. This is a really, really good pickup because he is homegrown uh, and an excellent, excellent football coach. So I'm super excited about that. Alan, what do you think? He's trading in, picking up his season tickets for being on the sideline for real? Yeah, you know, it is, first of all, welcome back to a UCF legend. Obviously, someone's in the UCF Hall of Fame, someone that's coached at coached at UCF for a very long time under multiple coaching staffs. If you guys recall, obviously he was there under O'Leary. And even when O'Leary left, uh, Coach Heupel, I'm sorry, excuse me, Coach uh, Frost decided to keep him on the staff and for good reason. He wanted that continuity. He knew what he meant to UCF being a UCF legend. Let's remember Sean Becton is top five pretty much in almost every uh, wide receiver statistical category in UCF history. And like you said, the recruiting, um, he recruited, you know, I think for the longest time at UCF where we may have lacked at other positions. We know two positions would always be set. Even when we were in the group of five, it was wide receiver and DB. And to be honest with you, those compared to historically have been two of the most disappointing positions in, in recently, at least under Gus, just as far as the depth that's not there. Yes, we've had star players there like Javon and guys like that, but just the depth hasn't been there like it had been under uh, Becton and, you know, Frost and even Heupel. Um, and so getting him back, I think obviously will help really a lot with recruiting, but I think also with development because we've gotten – names on paper uh with some of these receivers but they just the high school guys have not materialized lately for UCF think about the last under Gus what high school receiver has really been great it's been other than maybe Townsend it's all been uh transfers Baker Hudson you know guys like that so um you know him coming back to potentially develop these, you know, wide receivers. Cause now we're getting, you know, four star receivers like Bradell Richardson and all these guys. So, you know, we, we want to get that position exciting again. I mean, for the longest time, I can always remember UCF would have three studs at receiver and two or three guys waiting in the wings who you knew were going to be good. And it started to show flashes as freshmen that hasn't materialized. I mean, it feels like the last high school, two good high school receivers we've had have been Townsend and, and then before that probably Ryan O'Keefe. So it's been a while. So to get him back, I think that does a lot for the morale. I think it's, you know, a guy like him coming back home is always great. Um, you know, to me, it's, uh, it'll be interesting to see if it feels like it's only a matter of time before he becomes wide receiver coach, not trying to put any controversy out there, but, uh, let's be honest, the last few wide receiver coaches at UCF have not lasted, whether it's Grant Hurd or uh, the one before that, I'm drawing a blank on his name, but uh, they've only been staying, you know, a couple of years. So it'll be interesting to see if he kind of stays in the analyst role or if he ends up, you know, moving back to that wide receiver role, but either way it's, I think it's very exciting to get him back for development and recruiting. Yeah, for sure. And the big thing there uh, is development um, because he was the guy who developed uh, JJ Wharton and all of the uh, uh, Brashad Perriman and, all of those guys back through all, history. Yeah. yeah, all of them. He he was the guy who did that. He was the one who, uh, he's hard-nosed, he's hardworking. Um, he brings that, he also brings that hard-nosed football mentality back that, you know, we'll talk a little bit later about Gus and what he's trying to big back, bring back to the season. But he's that guy, and he's very good. He put more NFL receivers 
uh, uh, out of UCF than any other coach that exists. And I think it actually would be a positive if he did end up taking over wide receiver duties because that frees up our OC to focus on that. So, um, you know, nothing but positive things to say about Sean Becton uh, coming back. Even after he went to Nebraska, he was still a season ticket holder. That's kind of why we were saying that joke. He showed up at practice one day and he was watching when he was on the Nebraska staff and uh, Hypel, I think, had a uh, conniption about it. And uh, he basically was 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 people were saying he was trying to watch, you know, trying to steal stuff for practice. But realistically speaking, he was just trying to, uh, you know, catch catch practice back at his home, uh, his home team. So uh, Becton, you know, he's worked well with wide receivers. He's worked well with um, tight ends. He was uh, he coached up uh, Jordan Akins, who was also an NFL player. So don't forget uh, that he can he can work with those uh, what not only the wide receivers, but the tight ends as well. And he's really, really good uh, at teaching wide receivers and tight ends how to catch the ball. That's one thing that we've been missing. We've seen all these crazy interceptions this past season that happened where people got their hands on it. It flipped up in the air or whatever. Um, but he's just, he's just phenomenal with hand-eye coordination and making sure that once guys, if guys can get a hand on the ball, they come down with the ball. So um, just, just, you know, to throw a few names out here, Brashad Perriman, Josh Reese, JJ Wharton, Renal uh, Renel Hall, all of those guys uh, were his guys, and a lot of guys made it to the NFL. So um, phenomenal that a lot of UCF fans, because he had been, rumor was last season, he was sniffing around the program, trying to get back into the program, didn't work out. This season, he's got his foot in the door, and I expect him to become wide receivers coach. If he doesn't do it this year, he'll do it next. So I don't know if that's a budget thing. Um, but, uh, definitely expect him to make a big, big impact. Um, all right. So moving on from that, uh, other big news that came out this week, as we ramped up for fall camp, we got our, our four team captains. So, uh, Ethan Barr, um, you know, a guy that, that was a team captain on his former team impact player. Uh, everybody's given him rave reviews as far as his work ethic while he has been here. Uh, he was supposed to go to Washington, but then the Washington coach left. And so he came to UCF. So I think we're really, really lucky to have Ethan Barr. Uh, he, he, from a linebacker perspective, he's very much like the Terrence Plummer mold as far as who he is, how he conducts himself. Uh, so I expect a lot out of him. KJ Jefferson, um, no surprise there, right? KJ is the leader of this team. If you watched a lot of his interviews, he was working on, um, you know, establishing those bonds and, and really trying to, you know, hold the barbecues, so to speak, to make sure he's bringing the team together uh, for the year. And then RJ Harvey, no, uh, no surprises there either. Uh, RJ is, is back again and bigger than ever. Um, and he's one of those guys that's one of those quiet leaders, right? He, he works hard. He doesn't try to make himself look better than anyone else. He produces on the field. Uh, and he's going to be a leader for the rest of the running back room. So love to see that. And lastly, Marcellus Marshall, um, you know, another guy that's a senior guy that's earned his reps and earned the respect of the rest of the team. So what do you think about this, Alan? That these are these are four, I think, great names uh, for us to, to see that. I'm surprised we didn't see a certain Lee Hunter on there as well as a uh, as a captain so what do you think about that yeah i'm a little bit surprised by that too i would have thought lee hunter just how much he stepped up uh in the locker room and how much gus has praised him the fact that he obviously went to media day um recently that you know he would have you know been a captain um then you know obviously rj does not surprise me as a captain marcellus marshall doesn't uh surprise me a captain he's obviously you know i think our best offensive lineman, a guy that's now in the second year, uh, his in his second year in the program after transferring over. Um, so that doesn't surprise me. You know, I, I'm always interested, maybe not surprised, but interested when you do see transfers as in like their first year on the team uh, already as captains. I feel like that's something in, in pro sports and just in sports in general that you don't quite see because it almost feels in my, at least in my opinion, that 
kind of takes away from maybe a guy that's been in the locker room that could in theory be more deserving compared to a guy that got here two, three months ago. Um, you know, obviously that being said, KJ is, you know, a fifth year senior, a guy with a ton of experience and a quarterback in general is, is usually a leader in a football locker room. So, you know, I guess that's not that um, surprising. And Ethan Barr, I mean, you know, again, given his experience, the fact that he's a four year SEC guy has a lot of locker room and football experience, not surprising, just, just, you know, uh, you know, obviously KJ and him are both, you know, upperclassmen. They've been in college football for a long time. Um, but it is always interesting at least to see two transfers that literally what probably got on campus within the last three, four months uh, already make it. I guess that says more about them than anything. The fact that they've uh, meshed well with their teammates, have chemistry, and they're showing in the locker room that they're worthy of it. Because I know it is obviously voted on by the other players. So it's obviously deserving. I'm not taking anything away from that. Just interesting to see the trans uh, a transfer kind of nab that spot. But uh, yeah, those four, I think, obviously seem like leaders. They're all seniors, um, all been in college football for quite some time. I could see how they would have dominant voices within the locker room. Um, the only, you know, I think the only other people I were look, I was looking um, to see other than, um, you know, who you had mentioned, Roger, was maybe a Kobe Hudson, because um, Gus Malzahn had talked about how he wanted Kobe to step up into a leadership role, a guy that was somewhat quiet, especially last year behind Javon Baker. But now with Baker graduated, Kobe is kind of looked at as that wide receiver one um, in the locker room and, you know, obviously our most talented and best receiver on the team and someone that he, he's even said in interviews that he feels like he's more of a leader. He's a guy that's stepped up and started mentoring a lot of the younger receivers. He's specifically said how he's mentioned, uh, you know, mentored guys like Xavier Townsend, um, some of the freshmen that came and rolled early uh, over the summer that he's been mentoring them. So that is someone that I thought maybe could also be a leader. I don't know if there's a limit, if four is the limit, if there could be more, but that was someone I was also looking to see that I thought could be named um, a team captain. But as far as the other four, it, it makes sense for sure. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting on the on the Kobe Hudson uh, standpoint. It's also interesting that it's three offensive players and one defensive player last year. Um, we only had three captains. So um, that's another interesting tidbit. You had John Rice Plumley, uh, obviously a QB who was uh, a, a captain, uh, but this was that was his second year uh, with the program. You had, you had I'm going to murder this because I never say it right, Lokahi Paoli. Paoli. Yeah, he uh, obviously a veteran offensive lineman, very, very strong player. Uh, and then you had Joshua Seliskar uh, last year from the D-line. So it's interesting to me that there were three. Now, one thing I will say is it doesn't really surprise me uh, when it comes to, to transfers being voted as captains because we have so much roster turnover. 40 new guys uh, came in through the transfer portal this year. So we had a lot of turnover. We had a lot of turnover for a reason. And I feel like maybe some of that comes from the fact that there's still competition at those other uh, positions because we've had so many folks transfer in. And because of that, you didn't really have anyone who's who's dominant or has proved it yet to be the leader of that room, especially those that have transferred in late in spring. So, you know, I, I think it's more a reflection of that. But Kobe Hudson, definitely, definitely someone that I think could uh, could have been that, but he may not have been vocal enough uh, to be that leader. So, It'll be interesting to see how it all shakes out, but I think that's a pretty good group. Like you said, a lot of senior leadership, and let's hope that they, you know, they not only lead with the effort that they're putting on, you know, on the field, in the practice facilities, but also are vocal enough to pull us through those tough spots um, when we, like last year, when we had so many close games, because that was the biggest difference with that 2017 team, that 2018 team, was those voices that were on the sideline that you know never felt like they were counted out and we're always able to push everybody forward and keep that energy up so it'll be really really interesting to see how these guys do that uh with the team well yeah i mean it's interesting like you just said like about how we had those leaders in 2017 2018 and obviously in in many years before that um on other ucf rosters but it's something that i think trey's talked about extensively on this podcast that they're they, when he's attended games or watched on TV, he hasn't seen those guys on the locker uh, or excuse me, on the sideline 
um, during the games and will pick the team up, get the team excited. If they're down, kind of making them know, hey, you messed up or <clears throat> he just <clears> – <throat> hasn't seen those guys that um, are, are stepping up as leaders, at least vocally, at least what he can see publicly. And I think, you know, obviously has a keen eye to be able to notice, you know, what's going on if we're down close in a, in a tight game, or, you know, maybe we've blown a lead, like such as in the Baylor game last year, like where are those guys that are going to step up? But I, I, I think, you know, these leaders I'm excited about because, you know, RJ is extremely well respected, especially after the year that he had last year. So he can command that respect. And then when you I think you look at a guy like an Ethan Barr, who's, you know, um, and, and obviously KJ two guys that coming from the SEC, I think they kind of garner that respect and they, they maybe maybe they needed a new voice. Maybe it was good to that. It wasn't just you know, players on the team exclusively that were on the team, you know, last year or years prior, maybe it's good to get that new voice in there. You know, guys like, um, you know, Ethan and, and KJ, that have probably been in some pretty, you know, tight situations and pretty crazy games being in the SEC playing in obviously hostile environments uh, in the SEC, whether it's Alabama or LSU or Georgia or whatever. So I think they could probably have, you know, a calming presence. And I'm excited to see that because, we've seen the best teams in UCF history. They've always had, like you said, great leadership and we need that. And I'm not saying that there wasn't any leadership in the last couple of years, but something was clearly missing. And, and when a former player calls it out and mentions it, it's obviously, you know, something that's true. So um, I think. Well, it wasn't just a uh, former player, meaning Trey, but when he was on the sideline, it was multiple former players. And that was the discussion point when they were all on the sideline together for multiple games. You know what I mean? Uh, right. That that was that was the thing for me. It's not just Trey's opinion, right. but many of the other former players, because a lot of them come back for various games and get sideline passes and hang out on the sideline. A lot of them saw that, and we saw it. I mean, we've talked about it before. I, I talked about the Maryland game, how guys were, you know, jumping up and down on the benches. They had those. Uh, I don't know if you remember the bowling pin celebration that they had going on. They had the electric shock celebration and all that stuff on the sideline, just getting people hyped. And we didn't see that the last couple of seasons. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, like you said, if, it, if multiple former players are mentioning and that's what they're talking about in group chats or whatever it is, I mean, that's clearly a, a an issue. So um, I, I think you're starting to see, you know, I know we're going to get into more season previews even this week. And then in, in obviously in the ensuing weeks, as we get closer to the season, but um, that's something I'm really looking to is who is the leadership on this team, do they make a difference in the locker room, do, not just on the field, but really off the field? Because, um, you know, the best teams, it's funny. I mean, everyone knows talent, 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 but you see it in every single sport that sometimes you have extraordinarily talented, whether it's a trio in basketball or extremely talented, you know, you know, 11 and, you know, 11 guys on both sides of the ball that are extremely talented. Talent doesn't win every ball game alone. There, there's there's other intangible things there that need to happen for special seasons to happen. You, you cannot win on talent alone. Obviously, we know the big ones, talent and coaching and things like that. But, but you know, having those things like chemistry, that's, you know, something intangible. Having those things like leadership is intangible that, you know, that you really have to have for UCF to achieve the goals they want this year. Cause we've all said it this year. It, it's not, and the, the talent is there. Maybe yes, we've talked about, there could still be some more depth in certain positions that hasn't quite caught up yet as we're still transitioning into the big 12, but, but the talent for the most part is there this year. It's going to come down to those little intangible things like the chemistry, like the leadership, like making the right coaching calls and all that type of stuff. So um, that's something I'm really going to be looking out for over the next, you know, month as we get, you know, geared up for the 2024 season is who really comes in that locker room and, and commands respect and, and make sure the right things are happening off the field. Awesome. Yeah. And I think this group, uh, we'll see that, but I think, you know, as we, as we start to talk about what we're expecting to see out of, uh, this camp, it's who are those guys going to be? Um, and, you know, will they be able to fire everybody up? I, I imagine there's going to be a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of talking out there on the field. So, all right. Uh, having said all that, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about Texas wide receiver transfer. Um, 
wasn't it Agai Hall? Yeah. Uh, he never he never enrolled on the roster, so he was going to be a walk on, but he was a a, a big time uh, Alabama receiver. Everybody was pretty excited about him. Um, this I don't think this was. I think he was also a Texas uh, as well, um, but he was a big time receiver that was coming in to UCF and was expected to do big things. So it's kind of interesting that he announced that he was going to be joining us, but has not joined us yet. I don't know. I don't think that has anything to do with his walk on status. I don't know if it has to do with enrollment status. Nobody really has said anything because this is relatively new information. The roster was just released at camp uh, earlier today. So we don't know yet why that is the case. If it's something that happened outside of, uh, you know, outside of uh, the football field, uh, or if it was just a matter of he's going to enroll later on and he hasn't been able to make it to campus yet. But that's definitely something to uh, kind of keep an eye on. He's the only player that uh, I know of that didn't make it to campus that was expected to. So no official anything from UCF, no mention of it, just kind of quiet on the Eastern front. And then, you know, all of a sudden we see that he's not on the roster list. So, uh, Alan, did you, did you hear anything about that? I haven't. I mean, all I saw was that, you know, the tweets that kind of came out today that, um, that he is someone that did never officially enrolled. Remember, transfers in order for them to you know officially be in the roster uh they actually have to enroll at school so you can announce that you're transferring to whatever school um but if you don't enroll you're not officially if you don't enroll in classes that is you don't you're not officially on the roster it's similar to dg at ucla he transferred to ucla never <clears throat> enrolled in classes and that's why he was able to transfer to uh uh, Oklahoma just a couple weeks later after that. So with, with Hall, um, yeah, I mean, obviously unfortunate, but you know, I'm, I, I know there was a lot of hype around this K, but I, I'm, I'm okay with him not being on the roster. And I'll tell you why we've seen it with these guys that go to multiple schools within a one to two year period. We saw, I, I know I always bring these guys up, but the, the two line uh, linebacker trans we had a couple year ago, uh, Scissor Ants and Brandon Jennings, you know, these were guys that were at basically when you include UCF, right, we're basically at three schools in one year. And that is what's with Hall. He, he initially obviously started out at Alabama, was there a year, had a couple snaps. Then he transfers to Texas, doesn't play. And now he transfers to UCF. Look, as, as talented as he is, I, I don't think there's not a lot of stories you see where these guys, um, end up panning out. I mean, for whatever reason, you know, if they're transferring multiple times like this, unless it's some bizarre reason or whatever it is, um, they're not working out. And obviously I'm not saying if you transfer more than twice, you, you can't be good. Cause look at DG's transferred, you know, three times. And obviously he's going to, he's the Heisman favorite this year. But when you're talking about a guy that transfers multiple times within a year and doesn't play at any of those schools, um, that's usually to me is a red flag. So for me, I think we've, we landed two other very, um, talented wide receiver transfers this year from Auburn and Ohio, as well as all the incoming freshmen that we have. And of course, uh, our two returning studs at wide receiver. Yes, it would have been nice for depth, but I I'm okay with this move uh, for UCF. I mean, yeah, he was he had all the talent in the world coming out of high school. He was massively recruited, a four-star guy. He was ranked as the number uh, 45 player nationally, the number five receiver in the entire country, had an offer from every single school in the country, literally, uh, you know, over 40 offers and from every big school, but I don't know why he didn't end up making it on campus. But for me, uh, I, I think I'm okay with it. I, I personally, I have not seen at least since the transfer portal started and what, as it pertains to UCF, I have not seen one of the guy that fits this mold. Like I said, that transfers multiple times within one year work out. It just straight up has not worked. And we've seen that now with at least five or six players that they either don't play or they barely play and they end up leaving. Just like we saw with Terrence Lewis and Brandon Jennings and a couple of these other guys. So for me, it kind of fit that mold and it was a major red flag. And I think we have enough at wide receiver where I'm not sure he would have played unless, you know, he really, uh, you know, proved himself at some point during camp. So um, maybe we'll find out more what would happen and why he didn't make it. But, uh, you know, I'm okay with it. 
Well, I mean, let's look at the wide receiver um, depth that we have, right? So you've got Gerard Baker uh, at wide receiver, Jordan Bridgewater. Now he's a freshman, um, so not expecting him to get, you know, playing time. Uh, but he does add to that depth at that wide receiver group. Kobe Hudson, obviously, uh, we talked about him. Everybody knows who Kobe is. Um, Javarius Johnson, who, uh, you know, he's a redshirt senior. He's supposed to be uh, pretty good. So I expect a lot out of him. Jacoby Jones, redshirt senior. Um, Chauncey Magwood made some noise um, in the in the spring and also uh, in the offseason. You know, for those of you that remember the days where people were doing a lot of work outside of you know the traditional practices i was i drive by the stadium quite frequently in the evenings and i saw a lot of wide receivers putting in work um over by the shot put cage that's over there for olympic sports in front of the stadium so i expect a lot out of this wide receiver group in addition to that you've got tyree patterson uh you know redshirt freshman you've got uh Bradell richardson we talked about him in the spring he was making a lot of noise. I expect a lot out of him. I ex I actually expect him to break into the um, break into the rotation. You've got Kason Stokes, who's a freshman, so I don't expect much out of him. You've got X. You know, X Xavier Townsend still out there. He the crazy thing to me is he's only a junior, um, but he's listed out there, and we know that X is going to get his. So. You've got Kobe Hudson, you've got him, so you've really only got one other wide receiver spot that's open. So I'm pretty comfortable with what we have at wide receiver, and um, I think that that we, I think we'll be just fine without him. Would have been nice to have him, but I think we'll be just fine without him. So um, yeah. the worst thing that could have happened is we bring someone who's negative uh, into the locker room because this this season with all the players that we have is all going to be about attitude and cohesion uh, when it comes to this team. Yeah, I, I think it, we do have it. I mean, I'm like, I mentioned the previous segment, um, you know, UCS wide receiver depth has been a little shaky uh, since Gus has been here really since that whole, um, you know, class of, of uh, Marlon Williams and Jacob Harris and Trey, uh, Nixon, all those guys, since they graduated, it's been a little shaky. We've had a lot of, you know, top end guys at wide receiver one and two, but it, it's, if you look at really the last two years after our top three guys, it fell off very dramatically to the point where, I mean, Javon, Kobe and Townsend were essentially playing every snap at wide receiver and no one else was getting reps. I mean, yes, there was some garbage reps and a couple guys that came in here and there. But if you looked at it after the, the you know, those top three that I mentioned, of course, at tight end, like whether it was Alec Hall or Randy Pittman, no one had over five catches for UCF uh, that was a wide receiver. Basically, it was basically, yeah, no one that was a wide receiver. Tight ends and running backs obviously have more than that, but no other wide receiver besides the three that I mentioned had over five catches. And it's been that way for quite a while at UCF where, yes, the top end talent is there. But if you remember dating back to 17, I mean, Marlon Williams was on the bench his first couple of years. I mean, you had got, we had so much talent at the position that stars that were not stars yet were just sitting there on the bench. And that has not been the case for a while. And I don't mean, oh, they're not playing because, you know, we have too much depth and they can't even see the field. No, UCF needed wide receiver bodies on the field, especially when guys were getting banged up. Like Townsend had some injuries last year, um, but no one could get on the field. And I actually, uh, inside scoop, I heard from multiple parents <clears throat> that that was the same thing. Um, wide receiver parents that, you know, they, there needed to be more reps for other wide receivers, but no one could get on the field because quite frankly, they just either weren't ready because they were too young or they just weren't good enough, such as some of the transfers. So um, that is something that really is odd and rare at UCF because we've never had that problem in wide receiver dating back to the conference USA days. Um, but now, yeah, I do think um, when you talk about a guy like Javarius Johnson, who was Auburn's leading receiver two years ago, then you have a guy like Jacoby Jones, who is Ohio's leading receiver. I can't remember if it was last year or the previous season. Um, and then, you know, when you and that you have those two guys who should be able to see extensive minutes and be productive. 
um, in addition to obviously Hudson and Townsend. And then you have guys like Chauncey Magwood, uh, who you mentioned, and um, J- Jared Baker, who you mentioned, uh, plus all these really talented freshmen who are already getting uh, some solid hype, specifically like Burdell or Richardson. I, I do think we have enough, and I do think that we're going to start to see the wide receiver room turn a corner as far as depth, and we're going to see the next wave that – I'm not as worried about a guy like Kobe Hudson graduating because I think you're going to see this year, you're going to see some wide receiver role players emerge and you're going to see the guys that are on the cusp of stardom start to emerge. At least that's that's my hope. But I do think you could tell in the recruiting, if you look on offense, wide receiver has been by far the most recruited position um, in, in out of high school for UCF over the last couple of years on offense. Um, and then even in the transfer portal, it's gone very heavy. So I think Gus recognizes what's happened at wide receiver in recent years. And I would think that the moves that he's made between the portal and, and these talented freshmen that we're getting, that there's going to be some that pans out and we're going to get a lot closer back to what we're used to seeing at wide receiver at UCF. Yeah. I mean, the big thing for me, like when I'm thinking about this, right, is these these receivers are going to give us the flexibility to be able to give our receivers some uh, rotations back through. And it also makes it harder for opposing defenses to figure out what we're trying to do. I mean, we were we're running a lot of go routes <laughs> last uh, last season. Right. And there'll be some folks that are better at blocking. So that'll allow open up other schemes as well. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, this that's a what we need and b i'm not scared of such a big drop off if we do start to plug and play other receivers into uh, the game as we kind of move along so i think it gives us flexibility i think we've got good depth uh, i i agree with you that the uh, you know the freshman next year will um definitely 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 make impact uh especially Bridell richardson some of the guys that you know were we're going to be bringing in next year. We'll probably bring in someone like a Kobe Hudson or something like that. That's a, that's a senior uh, as well. And, but you know, to your point about the, the last two years in wide receiver recruiting, you got to remember we lost some big wide receivers to the transfer portal too over those past two years. And, you know, we've got uh, Josh Heupel uh, and his departure and taking some uh, talent with him as well. So there's, Josh also didn't do a great job of recruiting, uh, period. So, you know, that's, that's part of it. You're going to, it's going to take a a minute to reload, right? So not rebuild, but remote, uh, reload. And I think we're now getting to the point where we're at the reload stage as opposed to the rebuild stage. Um, so that's, uh, I'm, I'm confident and comfortable with, with not having someone, uh, come in like that. Although, there was a lot expected of them. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the preseason award list. So some uh, the Maxwell Award watch list came out. RJ and KJ uh, were both on that list. This this award, as a reminder, is presented to the best player in college football. No, it's not the Heisman. Uh, this is the Maxwell Award, and, and the Heisman really is dominated by quarterbacks these days. So. Um, you know what? What are your thoughts? Do you do you have the odds on on what those were? Do they are the odds out yet on the Maxwell Award winners and what um, RJ? That's a, good, that's a good question. I don't. Do they do odds for like just those type of awards? I, I thought it's morally for like the Heisman and stuff like that. But uh, let's see if there is an odds for that. Um, I don't know if they do uh, odds. Or at least I don't see any right now that have come out for specifically for those type of awards. But um, I mean, yeah, I think if you look at our team, who are the most obvious choices for a Maxwell award winner? First of all, I would presume that that uh, list is a lot of offensive players. I know it, I know it's for the top player in college football, but we all know most people just kind of look at, uh, you know, offense. I'm actually looking at the um, entire list here. So there's quarterback, running back, receiver, um, and it looks like actually, okay, maybe it is only offense because actually there's only quarterbacks, wide receivers, and running backs on this list. So maybe uh, it only applies to offense, but the exact description actually from the website is the best player 
uh, in college football. So I guess um, that, but I guess it only applies to offense. So um, if you look though, then at our, um, if you look at our, who, who the obvious players that would be on that list, it, to me, in my mind, I think most reasonable people on the team would agree our three best players in offense are KJ, RJ and Kobe Hudson, you know, by a mile. Um, it could prove to be otherwise. It could be, you know, someone like Penny Boone or who knows, Randy Pittman may go crazy this year. But I think as far as who is named to a preseason list, as far as, you know, you have to base it obviously off of last year and what they did. I think it makes obviously the most sense for on UCF uh, for it to be KJ and RJ. So no surprises there. Maybe, like I said, only Co I could have seen Kobe on that list too. But, um, you know, looking at this list right here, it's, it's dominated by quarterbacks by far. There's about looks like about 12 or maybe about 20 running backs, um, maybe about 10 receivers. And then the rest of the list is by far dominated by quarterbacks. So um, yeah, I think it makes sense. And then when you well, the, even think of just the Heisman in general, it's usually a running back or, or a quarterback in college football. Yeah. The interesting thing um, I think is for RJ, I, I think he's, Last year, he was kind of like under the radar. And even this offseason, it was like everybody was talking about the Texas Tech running back. They were talking about the OSU running back, Oliver, you know. Um, but RJ was right there with him. And he was getting some noise during the season. But then it kind of petered out because Oliver, um, you know, put put on a few more yards. But he was right there. So he can really make a name for himself. And I think he got enough noise in the offseason or last during the season last season and in the off season, everybody's like, "Oh, this this aha moment when they started talking about UCF." That I think that he will definitely be, you know, if he performs at a level or even above last year's level, I think he he has a real shot at it. And you know, the thing with Kobe Hudson that people forget was last year, Kobe Hudson was leading in receiving yards most of the season. Gerard Baker was clear number one, uh, but Kobe Hudson was actually leading until the very end of the season. Now, just to kind of put clarity around this, and then and then we'll uh, pivot away from this. But the Heisman and the AP Player of the Year honor uh, the most outstanding player, uh, while the Maxwell and Walter Camp Award recognizes the best uh, player. Archie Griffin Award recognizes the MVP, um, and you know, at the end of the day, the Maxwell and Walter Camp Awards are uh, basically the best player. And I don't know what, what the difference is between the best player and the most outstanding player. Yeah. Um, but you know, that that's by definition what it is. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and pivot away from the Maxwell award list. Um, first day of camp today, as we mentioned earlier, Gus dropped a presser. Um, you know, Gus, I've been telling everybody who's been listening to the show, that he has been much more focused uh, this off season. The interactions I've had with him, the interactions, even um, you know, the Space Knights did had a uh, a preview with uh, Christy Malzahn after the um, they always cover the um, the women's clinic thing that they did, and they did that last week uh, on Wednesday, and she was even talking about how focused. Gus is and and she was expressing her she's as much as a football fan not just a Gus fan but a football fan as the rest of us as she protects her husband which she should uh, but at the same time she was not happy with the effort and the things that happened last season and she kind of took it on the chin and as a personal affront as well Gus after that season was not happy it's the only time in his career that he's been you know, under 500. I mean, during the season, he still wasn't under 500. But with the bowl, bowl game loss, we finished at six and seven. He was not happy about that. I think Gus also let the reins go a little bit. Christy, uh, for everybody, remember, Christy Malzahn had that scare that literally almost took her life. And so uh, Gus, I think, had a gut check moment. Christy hasn't been as involved as she normally is. She is now again because I think she's fully healthy. Uh, but while he was dealing with that, he tried to hand off the reins a little bit, and um, it was his reputation that took the took the hit. And I don't think he's happy about that. So he is all about taking taking control back. Um, his presser today 
was hard nosed. His body language was hard nosed. He said he told everybody that they were going to be uh, this. They're going to be back to a very, very difficult camp as they were the first year that he came on board. Um, you know, he's not taking it easy on anyone. His expectations are high. He called people out. He was very candid today. Uh, he was. I, I don't think he was happy with the fundamentals. He talked about being able to snap the ball for a quarterback um, so they don't have to think about it. They're just thinking about their RPO within a box. Um, you know, we had some issues at center last year, so I'm wondering if he wasn't happy uh, with that and what he saw at the first practice. But I, I feel like this is going to be a no-holds-barred kind of thing. I don't think that uh, Gus is going to pull any punches, and he's definitely – under control and his expectations and his attitude are completely different than they were last year. I think he, he really took this past season personally and he's bound to determine not to have that happen again. In fact, Ladarius Tennyson also, um, you know, is a name you should know on defense and someone who uh, was, was uh, at the mic today and the, he was asked a question, you know, did you, did you notice a difference in uh, Gus Malzahn because everybody in the press noticed, could see it visibly, heard it in his voice, the language that was used. Um, and he said, we got the old coach Gus back. So I think that that fire is in his belly. I think he's in a prove it. I think he was angry about what happened last year. I think that Christie's even angry about what happened last year and it wasn't reflective of the quality of the coach that he is. I think he took a lot of pride in that. And I think you're going to really see him push the team and the attitude is going to be focused on winning and pushing as hard as you possibly can. And I, I think really it hurt him too in the way that we lost things. He, he harped today on, you know, uh, mistakes. So penalties, um, you know, he harped today on finishing. Uh, we, we all know that we weren't happy with our red zone uh, offense. The team actually did really well on third down and fourth down conversions. And that's usually an indicator of a, if you're at around anywhere near 40% uh, on on third down conversions, let alone 50% on, on fourth down conversions, that's usually a formula for a win. And that there's gonna be a lot of wins there. And so not much talk about the defense today uh, from Gus Melzon. I think he's gonna probably do what he did last year which is to let the uh, defensive coaches talk about the defense. Uh, but he was not happy. And his big mantra has been defensively, we got to stop the run. Yeah. Now, yeah. I mean, it is interesting to see his, his tone and how he talked. I think we're used to seeing Gus as a guy that is, I don't want to say happy go lucky, but just a guy that always seems somewhat, positive at you know these pressers you know and yeah he gives coach speak and he gives he he says the same thing over and over but he's usually very positive and um usually you know talks up that upcoming season and you know says talks about the expectations and kind of you know kind of provides a bright outlook if you will on on most of the time but this time like you like you said he was a lot more stern a lot more serious and i think just based on every we've mentioned this multiple times on this podcast, how he's, he's set huge expectations on the seasons, not only on his actions in the portal and making the coaching staff changes, but in his actual quotes to the media, whether, you know, it's talking about how, you know, if we, if we can win the big 12 this year, this program is going to take off that, you know, six and seven is not acceptable that, you know, he made all these moves and he's quote unquote going all in. Those are his words. Um, and he really kind of backed it up and reinforced that today, but in a much more serious tone that, you know, basically I think he stated that, you know, that it, it wasn't acceptable what happened last season and that that focus is there. And that he said that this year's, uh, camp that started today is going to be tough. There's not going to be, you know, veterans and and seniors that are getting days off to, you know, recover from, you know, small nagging injuries. They're not going to get those rest days. Um, they are going to, you know, have to have to go through it. He wants them to be mentally tough and physically tough uh, for this upcoming season. And, you know, he wants there to be basically accountability um, you know, yeah, put up or shut up. <laughs> exactly. I mean, there, there's going to have to be accountability in this locker room and that 
that this year, you know, he's kind of pushing all his chips in and saying, Hey, this is the year that we have to compete. It's the first year of the 12 team playoff and we expect to win the big 12. I mean, he's all, but basically said, we expect to win the big 12. So it was interesting to see his change in tone and change in demeanor uh, up there on the presser. And it was, you know, very serious that, Hey, we're, we're going out there to win. And he, ex and he basically said, I don't, he, I think one of his quotes was, I don't care if you are on this preseason award, Award list or that one basically basically calling out his stars saying i don't care what what your standing is if you, you're getting all this hype you need to come in and be available um you know and you got to take this training camp serious and, I, and I, I like it i think setting that tone um that you know that this year is not last year we're not just happy to be in the big 12 we are not in a transition year we're you know, it, you know, last year it was a pass. It was okay. You know, winning that Oklahoma state game, for example, and winning our first big 12 game was, you know, the big moment. That's not going to be enough this year. We need to be better than most of the big 12, if not the best. So um, I thought it was interesting that, that he, he can, he's basically reinforcing. It. He's not backing down. So he's setting very big expectations for this fan base. And we know what this fan base does with big expectations. I mean, mm -hmm. after that defeated season, we basically expected to go undefeated every single year afterwards. And we're disappointed we weren't. So I kind of like it. I mean, that's what the big boy programs do. You, you, I know we're not Alabama or Georgia, but they're all upset if they lose one game and it, the, the fan base melts down and whatever. I, I like that expectation. I know it's not realistic to be that amazing every single year at least not yet but i'd rather that be i'd rather it be a disappointment than we lose and not just like oh we're happy to be in the big 12 now we're happy with coasting with six seven eight wins no we want to get in that 12 team playoff right now right away even though it's only our second year in the big 12 and we want to defy odds and and be better and and show that you know the utahs and the tcus of the world that you know, once they, when they transitioned, it took them five, six years to really be a player in the conference. No, he's going after it in year two. So I like it. Yeah. I mean, the, it, and it's a consistent message. Uh, it's actually interesting because uh, Terry Mohajer sat down for an interview recently uh, within the past week to talk about the, the big 12 uh, initiative that we had, um, you know, to get us ready for that. And, and another big thing, by the way, is we hit our $41 million goal for fundraising for this year. We hit 40 million last year. The goal was to exceed that by before uh, the season started. And we did that. So uh, kudos to Terry and the team for doing that. But his big message was, you know, basically that we're not here. We're not happy with just being here. Um, and I don't, I don't think Gus is, and, and I don't think the rest I think the rest of college football media were expecting more just like we were. However, at the same time, this offseason was also the discussion point was of the four that joined, UCF was the one that showed that it that it deserved to be there. And I think that UCF, you know, as we talked about these close games, there was easily two to three more games that we should have won. We led almost every single game coming out of the half. Uh, this season, and we should have won at least two to three more. So I, I think Gus took that personally. I think he saw that as a reflection on the team. I think he saw that as a reflection on the coaching. He's his off season. His his conversation has been the entire off season. I did an evaluation of myself and where I went wrong, and um, I think I think he's coming out guns a blazing on that. And I think he knows that he needed to to put his foot in it a little bit more. And, um, you know, I think that's what you're starting to see. And that's that championship mentality that we're, um, you know, that's the championship mentality that we expect, but he also expects of himself and now is extending that to the, to the team. So that will only push this team further. There's no, hey, oh, oh my gosh, you know, uh, we lost this one, yada, yada, yada. And you saw that. Yes, JRP went out. Uh, he got hurt in that Boise game towards the end of that game. And we went on a, what was it, a four or five game losing streak. I don't think Gus wants to see that again. The fan base certainly didn't. And that's not UCF football. So that will to win is what he's trying to instill. He's holding not only the players accountable, but also he's been really big about holding himself accountable. Um, and I think that's what you're seeing. So it'll be really, really, really interesting to see if that translates to the field. We expect it to. We want it to. 
uh, the new um, the new defensive coordinator is also old style hard nosed football coach. So I think they're going to get a, a a dose of this is this is how you win in the SEC. This is how you win uh, games, and and this is what the expectation of you is, which is to win and win consistently and win now, not later. So I agree with the 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 he wants to win the Big Twelve statement. He set everything up for that. And um, the ex- the expectation is if these guys don't perform, he will not. It's no more Mr. Nice Gus. Uh, you know, he, he's going to he's going to call people out and and good on him for doing that. All right. Um, one one more quick note um, coming out of camp. Um, the roster. Uh, we saw the roster today. Everybody and, and Gus mentioned this in his presser as well. Everybody is playing right now and is practicing right now with the exception of Damari Henderson. Damari had a knee injury towards the end of last season. He is, uh, Gus did mention that he's expected to come back um, during the season, uh, but he was the only player right now that is injured. And and Gus said that was the first time that he hasn't had multiple players injured uh, starting fall camp. So, that's a good sign for us. We've had problems with the injury bug, um, you know, as of late. And uh, hopefully that's a good sign for the rest of the season. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, we've gone into quite a few um, seasons recently, uh, specifically in fall camp with the injury bug that's only gotten worse during the season. I mean, last year was – you know, relatively okay um, in terms of injuries compared to some of the past seasons under Gus. But, um, you know, obviously we have a new Was it though? Was Uh, it though? RJ Harvey was hurt. X was hurt. Um, Obviously, uh, JRP was hurt and hobbled for the rest of the season. He never quite fully recovered. JRP was only like serious, serious injury that was more than what, three or four games, I feel like. Uh, Like, I don't think we had too many big players that were season ending injuries from yeah, but yeah, there no, there was. But I mean, I'm all, I'm thinking like remember that 2021 20, season when in the first three games, I remember we lost Dylan Gabriel for the season. We lost Isaiah Bowser for several weeks. We lost um, Ricky Barber. We lost I think it was Salascar. We ended up losing. I remember it was like six, like basically our six best players, and not all of them were. Only DG was season ending, but we had lost like six or seven, like literally of our core players within like a three week period. So I guess I'm kind of thinking that that was back in 2021, obviously Gus's first season. But yeah, I mean, going in knowing that there's only one kind of serious or you know big time nagging injury as we head into fall camp is is good to hear, especially when you know that. They've obviously already gone through spring ball. They've gone through summer ball. So there was opportunities where they could have gotten injured. So, you know, it is good to see that. I mean, health is obviously another one of those intangible factors. Some obviously to a degree, you can't control that there's freak injuries, but you know how you- that's, that's also why you, you, that's why we've been talking about death, right? Because they're expected right. to get nicked up and hurt and we can't rely just on the first string guys to last the entire season. And that's why, uh, you know, I, let's face it. The lines are bigger. The linebackers are bigger. I mean, you look at K-State, all those guys, they're over 300-plus uh, pounds, right? 305, 310 pounds. They, you didn't have that in the AAC. Our line has gotten bigger. Uh, and on top of that, you know, the linebackers, if you look across uh, across the defensive line, um, you know, across the line of scrimmage at the at the linebackers, they're, most of those guys are 6'2", 6'3", 6'4", 240-plus pounds. That's different than what we faced at the AAC uh, level. And that's going to punish your offensive weapons. And if you're playing as many snaps as what we have been playing a a run heavy style of football, although we were about a 50, 50 uh, split still last year, as much as we, we thought we ran the football, uh, we still were a 50, 50 split, Um, not in the number of plays, but as far as the yardage gained, uh, which means that, you know, JRP threw more yards than people were giving him credit for. I think people kind of underestimated the number of yards that he threw. Obviously, we had um, his backup in for a couple, uh, two to three games. But what if he had been in those two or two to three games, right? So, um, you know, it, it's it's interesting that we still have that potent quick strike ability 
And I think that's going to get better, especially for the long bomb with KJ Jefferson. Yeah. I mean, it is. Um, but like, I mean, it is, it is interesting though. It's like, we are, we are putting in a lot of, you know, hope on to KJ Jefferson and um, you know, but that is like you said, why the depth is so important, why I feel good that we, um, that we brought in the backup uh, quarterback from Miami, because I, I said this actually in one of my, you know, uh, you know, interesting stats or not so interesting stats, whatever of the week was a, lot, was a while back, <laughs> whatever stats of the week, <laughs> whatever they're called. I forgot the name of the segment. Sorry. Um, that uh, UCF has not had a quarterback um, play the season from start to finish since 2020. So we're going on four straight years where there's been an injury to the quarterback where they've missed time. DG's missed time, JRP's missed time. Uh, and then obviously even, you know, DG, you know, obviously played all of 2020. That was the last time we had a fully healthy season. But then in 2019, you obviously had the whole thing wasn't injury related, but Brandon Wimbush and him, they split time in the beginning. Then obviously the season before that, you had uh, Mackenzie Milton get injured with Daryl Mack. So it, it's, it's been, you know, a whirlwind where we haven't really had consistency at the quarterback for an entire season, really in maybe only just once in the last, you know, six years or twice in the last six years. So, um, you know, we, we are hoping obviously KJ stays healthy that whole year, this whole year, because we do need that. And he's obviously still going to be the better option than, um, you know, than Jacoby, but um but, you know, that's why that depth is so important. So, you know, obviously quarterback, you don't want that to be injured no matter who your backup is. But uh, when it comes to the other positions where there's just more quantity of players, yeah, you are seeing a lot more depth there. Like you said, bigger linebackers, uh, bigger linemen and all that. So, you know, let's pray for a healthy season. Yeah. And who you're talking about is Ja'Curry Brown. Uh, Ja'Curry, that came yeah, that's my Ja'Curry answer. Answer. Yeah, we had Jacoby. another quarterback named Jacoby though. The, the Hurricanes said at one point. I know they did. It was a Jaco- uh, was it was Jacoby Brissett there or no or someone? They had another Jacoby at one time. I do remember. <laughs> yeah, I don't care about Miami, so we're not going to talk about them. Uh, they 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 they're more like Jabroni, so we'll we'll just leave them there. Uh, but QB QB Jacoby Brown, you know he's he's a big guy too. He's six four two twenty, so he's in the same mold as uh as um you know what kj jefferson is kj is six foot three he's listed at 247 uh on the latest roster now he was obviously uh earlier in the off season <laughs> we learned that he was a little bit heavier than that but having seen pictures of him um and video of him coming onto the field he definitely looked like he slimmed down but you know uh, he he you know, as far as a backup quarterback position, Jacuri Brown coming in 6'4", 220, expected to at least contend, if not uh, be Miami starter this year. Uh, I feel a lot better if if something, God forbid, were to happen um, to KJ Jefferson. So uh, good on uh, good on them, and and I think we're in a good position there. All right, um, so. Last uh, last piece of this this uh, segment, we're going to be talking about previewing the offense, the defense uh, with former players. Uh, we're going to be previewing, um, you know, how the uh, the players have done throughout the camp. A little bit later in the camp, and especially after we start seeing um, more of the uh, scrimmages, because at the end of the day. Gus is not going to make his decisions on who's going to start until after he's gone through the scrimmages. He even reinforced that today. Uh, so we'll have someone come in, um, you know, at that point, we'll, we'll surprise you with that then. And then lastly, we're going to do a, a full season preview. But for now, let's talk about going into camp. What are you looking for on offense? Yeah. I mean, look, this is, this is a big camp. I think one of the things we know that, this team is going to score points. We know that the offensive firepower is there, whether it's running back, wide receiver, tight end, obviously our, our, our quarterback, uh, we have the firepower. A couple things that I'm going to be looking at, for me, the number one thing is, is that wide, and I mentioned it already on this podcast, but I'll say it again because to me it's the number one thing, is that wide receiver depth back, um, especially with Javon Baker gone. Are we going to have enough after Kobe and Xavier? We know those two guys are there. And 
look, we've seen it time and time again. I know Javarius Johnson and Jacoby Jones were very, very good at their last school, but just because you were good at your last school does not necessarily mean you're good at the next school, whether that's the system or the chemistry or whatever it is, it does not always translate. We've seen that many times with with transfers uh, on both sides of the ball the last couple of years. So I'm looking to who's going to be not just that third guy, because we've had three guys, like I've said, who's going to be that fourth receiver? Who's going to be that fifth receiver? Those fourth and fifth receivers are going to be that those guys that not only kind of play around the edges, you know, get some playing time, but also if there's an, a big injury, you know, hope obviously that there's not, but if there is, they're going to be, you know, thrust into a starting role. So I want to see who emerges there. That's, that's, that's one, that's the biggest thing for me, because I, I think we've seriously lacked up there for quite some time now. Um, the second thing to me is obviously KJ. I mean, I'm looking at like, is, you know, I think there's been some reports that his, you know, his camp, at least in summer was a little bit slower. He was still getting used to the playbook. He was still getting used to the system. He was still getting used to his new teammates. So not only does he, you know, be that guy that we saw at Arkansas for many years, um, but also is he step up to be a leader? Yes, he just got named a captain, but it's more than just being named captain. You got to show it you know, at the most important times during the season. So does he be that guy? Cause we've all kind of anointed him like, Hey, this is the best quarterback that's been at UCF in a long time. This is a guy that's getting Heisman, you know, uh, dark horse Heisman look, um, you know, this is a guy that was just named to a Maxwell uh, preseason award list. Like, is he that guy? We've seen it at Arkansas, but we've also saw last year was one of his, you know, not so great years. So is he that guy? The third thing I'm looking at is, how did the OC change affect things? Um, you know, we saw last year after seven or eight games, the report came out that Gus basically took over play calling duties after relinquishing them. Now we know that he is going to be the play caller, but he also obviously brought in a new OC, which is Tim Harris, uh, Tim Harris senior to be the, um, to be the, the OC who much more, I think, aligns with Gus's philosophy has been with Gus at multiple stints, including at, at UCF a couple of years ago after, you know, Harris went to Miami, now back to UCF. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very curious to see how that works out is not only, I mean, are they going to have a true kind of partnership there? And, and what I'm really looking at is can Gus be a really good play caller? I know he's known as one of the kind of godfathers of the modern offense, but Let's be honest, we saw a lot of mistakes on offense last year in, in key moments, whether it was that Oklahoma game for the extra point or whatever the case, or for the two-point conversion, excuse me, whatever it is that we've seen, it's not always been impressive at, at times. And we feel like we've left a lot of points on the table. And with this offense, there's really not an excuse. So I'm really looking to see, um, in, I know you're not going to necessarily see those plays in camp necessarily, but I think, I think to a degree you can kind of see if he's, you know, making – you know, the getting the t players in the right positions. Is he calling, uh, you know, good plays in practice as the offense excelling, you know, in scrimmages and in, in, in fall ball in general, what are the quotes that are coming out of camp that kind of talk about the overall playbook and things like that? And, and what do they see under their new OC being Tim Harris? Cause now this is essentially the third year in a row with a new OC, uh, you know, on the team. So that, that to me is what I'm looking at. And I think fourth, which I probably should have mentioned second to me, which is probably the second biggest thing after wide receivers is the offensive line, obviously, um, you know, how, you know, this is like the third year in a row that we've kind of mixed match guy, a uh, bunch of transfers and heavily relied on the portal to put together an offensive line. And it's the same, you know, this year uh, we added, you know, what three or four offensive linemen transfers two who are expected to be starters. So, you know, you have some of the mainstays like a Marcellus Marshall and an Adrian Medley and, and um, obviously, um, you know, guys like Paul Rubelt and uh, the Alabama transfer from a couple of years ago. But I'm really curious to see the offensive line. I think we all kind of agree that we have a pretty solid starting five in general, but we're not sure about the depth. And I'm still not sure about that. And specifically on the offensive line, you mentioned earlier, Roger, is is the center position. Is it going to be Caden Kittler? Is it going to be Walt Claire Flynn Jr., who has already gotten reps as a, as a true freshman um, at center, very highly recruited four-star guy, one of our highest ever um, you know offensive linemen commits who's already kind of making waves? 
Or is it going to be one of the transfers like a Jabari Brooks who uh, came over from the FCS from Samford? There's, they've all gotten play at center, but right now there's not a clear cut guy. I think we're all kind of expecting to be Caden Kittler, um, but that's going to be to me one of the biggest storylines in camp is who emerges as that starting center. Uh, so for me, I mean, I think those are kind of the big four things on offense and I'm really looking to see how those shape out. We probably won't get all of those answers because Gus thinks keeps things close to vest, but we're going to get, you know, some of those things like who's emerging at wide receiver three and four, who's probably looking like they're the starting center. Um, so things like that, that's what I'm really looking for out of camp. All right. So, um, you were really energetic talking about that. So uh, obviously, Alan's given this a lot of thought. I, I, I'm going to operate a little bit more off the cuff. I mean, for me, offensively, what I'm looking for, number one, is center position. That was what I was going to go with. Um, because the center, one, does a, a few things. They start the offense, right? So when it comes to the timing of it, when that ball is snapped, the QB can't be wondering, is the ball going to be in my hands, right? <laughs> and... Um, with an RPO, that's especially important because it's a bang, bang read. Uh, and it doesn't allow the defense that extra second to close the distance. Right. Um, number two for the offensive uh, line, what it also does that center sets the cadence and, and, and avoids those false start penalties that we saw early on last year, we struggled uh, at the center position. And then we finally, found somebody midway through the season who was consistent. So, you know, and Caden Kittler uh, was one of those people that struggled. So, you know, number three, that center position is important because they're reading the defense and pointing out who's rushing from where and when. So they've got to be in command of not only their position, uh, but also the call outs on the defensive line to make sure that they're calling out the right people and the right reads and helping the quarterback make the right read uh, on the front end. So that, that, that to me is the, the most important, um, you know, number two for me, KJ Jefferson, definitely is he, or will he be the guy that we know he can be? Um, I'm pretty comfortable with the rest of the offensive line. They were better than what he had at Arkansas. And that was a big reason why he had a downturn last season is because they were absolutely atrocious. Um, you know, and this is not just me talking. This is this is national uh, media saying the exact same thing. Um, you know, Josh Pate was talking about who the dark horse is uh, to for the playoff. He just had the had that come out this week, and it was UCF all the way. And and I won't bore you with the details of why he said that, but a lot of that hinges on whether KJ can be the KJ that we know that he can be. Um, so that's number two for me. Number three is going to be the tight end position. Um, the, what we have now is we have two pass, true pass catching tight ends. So the question is, is how are they going to be used? We've been screaming about, you know, being able to, to exploit the middle. Um, the last couple seasons with JRP, he was, he was not good in the middle, uh, of the field. Um, KJ Jefferson, uh, also statistically has not been great at throwing the ball. That that's his weakest passes in the middle. So if you've got two pass catching tight ends, do we get a little more creative uh, so that, you know, we're not just looking at the vertical routes, um, you know, when we're we're setting up for things. There's a lot of things you can do when you have a pass catching tight end. And it's also a great safety valve for your quarterback if he doesn't see a read um, as a check down. So I think that's huge. And then the question to me uh, for number four is Johnny Richardson versus X. Now that sounds like an oxymoronic stat of the week, right? Uh, but I I feel like Johnny Richardson, he is not going to get the carries that he should have or needs. He also is one of those guys that goes down at first contact. So he's not, we when we rush, we rush between the gaps, right? It's going to be an A gap, B, B gap zone type of rush. So I could see them getting creative with him, but it can't be it can't be a situation where like it was last year and the year before where when Johnny Richardson came in, you knew exactly what was being run. Right. So to me, I think what they're going to do is they're going to take Johnny Richardson and I think they're going to take X and uh, one, they'll have a backup because when X went out, that took a 
important piece of the playbook away that we had been running last year, which was getting someone of that size in space. And once you get them in space, allowing the speed to take over. And I think Johnny Richardson uh, and X will both fill that role for us as Johnny Richardson will not uh, get the number of touches that he should in the backfield. So I think that's a big thing to watch too, is, is how, because if you think about it, then at that point, from a receiver standpoint, you've got at least two good wide receivers that can play, you know, the vertical routes. You've got two guys that can, uh, can play on one side of the field underneath. And then you've got a pass catching tight end. That's a threat as well. So, you know, offensively, and when we're talking about driving the ball down the field and scoring quickly, that's, that is going to be something that could throw defenses off that we have not utilized uh, the past two years. As far as Tim Harris is concerned, we all know that uh, Gus is going to be running the offense this year. <laughs> He's going to be calling the plays. So it's not Tim Harris um, at all that's going to be doing that. Um, in fact, the the – Things that I heard was basically that Gus uh, was calling plays for the home games and uh, Henshaw was calling plays at a lot of the away games, just the way the schedule shook out. So um, I, I, I feel like Gus can be wholly invested. He is wholly invested and he will call the offense this year. So for me, that's what I'm looking for in camp is to see, do we see, especially in the scrimmages, do we see more use of the tight end position? How are X and um, how are X and Johnny Richardson, um, you know, going to be utilized? And then for the center position, who takes over the center position, and can they consistently be that center for us? That's going to last for the rest of the season. All right, defensively, uh, Alan, you were you had one in the chamber for offense. What what have you got for defense? Yeah, defense. Look. Um, to me, that is the, by far as a whole, as a position group, the biggest question mark heading into this season. We know, like I said, the offense is going to have firepower. The defense was, has been a letdown for quite some time now. I mean, I, I want to say for really for the, for the uh, majority of the Gus era. And like you mentioned, you know, before as a whole, yes, a lot of that is Josh Heupel's recruiting. It does take time, but let's be honest there. It has been a letdown. And Gus hasn't been relying on Josh Heupel players. He's brought in a ton of defensive transfers. And let's be honest, there's been a lot of bust. I mean, if you look at it really outside of, you know, a couple guys like a Ricky Barber and, um, you know, Big Cat Bryant and, you know, obviously Lee Hunter and a few other guys, it's it's not been great. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to say that's all his fault. And I know he still needs more time. And some of that was under the American athletic conference banner, but overall the, the defense has not been great. And it really, um, you know, the last couple of years, the big thing we've obviously harped on is linebacker. Uh, and that to me is still the number one storyline heading into uh, camp and, and obviously into the season is do, does it turn around a linebacker? I mean, basically, for the last two seasons, we've had two playable players. It's been Jason Johnson and Walter Yates. Two FCS guys were the only two guys that could really, they basically saw every single snap at the position. Um, so now I think he re Gus really recognized obviously that. And we brought in five or six linebackers uh, through the portal. So to me, um, and we've already heard great things. You've mentioned a couple of them, obviously Ethan Barr and people like that. Um, are they going to be the guys that finally make our linebacker room respectable again and something that can make tackles and stop the run and, and be, you know, the, the, those guys at the, on the middle of the field, the, the captains of the, the defense that are going to really make, uh, you know, a, a difference here because it's just for far too long that position really since, you know, guys like Tatum Bethune and Jeremiah Jean Baptiste have transferred, it's been a very lackluster and the weak link on the defense. Um, so to me, that's the biggest thing is, are we going to hear, we've already, yes, heard Ethan Barr is looking good. And we've heard obviously, you know, Josiah Pierre and a couple other names of guys that um, seem to have locked up starting positions, but it's not just about starters. We need to be able to have guys that can come in or it's going to be another Jason Johnson, Walter Yates type of situation again. Uh, we need more than just two or three guys that can, you know, be reliable. So um, that to me is the biggest thing. Who, who emerges from that group? Not just the transfers, but what about these guys like Andrew 
Harris and Troy Ford Jr. and all these highly recruited linebackers we got, who starts to finally emerge as, you know, the next guy up? Because a lot of these transfer linebackers are here for one year and, and they're out because they're seniors or, or super seniors at this point. So that's to me is by far the biggest storyline. The second one, which is a very close second to me, is the secondary. We've talked about this on multiple shows. How many freaking secondary transfers have we had in the last two years and not just transfers? Freshmen, my God, there was what nine DB transfers this off season. There's uh, are what's five or six guys in the in the class in the 2025 class even here yet. There's already five. I mean, he has done Gus has done everything in his power to rebuild and reload this secondary, but uh, so far the results have not been great. Um, you know, there, there's been a couple guys that have been solid, um, but a lot of the the guys that have been at DB the last few years have been um, you know, hypo guys, whether it was Brandon Adams, um, you know, Quadric Ballard, all these guys that have been the starters. Um, so to me, I'm really looking at is the secondary, it's similar, very similar to me, the wide receivers. DBs were always a position that we could depend on and, you know, has the most drafted guys out of any position in UCF history. Uh, plenty of stars that have developed in, in both in the college and the NFL level from the secondary, but I have not seen that there in quite some time. It, they did get better last year. They were in like the top 40, top 45, as far as passing yards allowed. But I think we know a reason for that stat is not necessarily, uh, you know, the skill more so that teams just ran all over us, but nonetheless, the stats did get better there. Um, so, but I'm really looking at, do we have some, some lockdown guys? We, they, uh, you know, our, our new DC Ted roof has talked about um, obviously stopping the run, but being more aggressive and getting turnovers. So I, I am excited to see, um, you know, what the DBs can produce. Are we going to see some guys out of camp that start to emerge um, and, and say, Hey, not only do we have some reliable starters, but we got some really good guys that can rotate in, um, you know, at, at nickel and, and, and all these different positions where it's been kind of lackluster. And then the third, and it kind of goes hand in hand is our, with the fourth is, are, are we going to be able to stop the run? I mean, obviously, I mean, you could really make a case that that is the number one storyline. Do we, do we, do we hear that the run stop has gotten better in camp? Do we, do we hear the offensive players give it some compliments and that goes hand in hand with how is our new DC? We got a guy that's a, um, that's, you know, uh, what's the word where you travel around a lot. Um, you know, journeyman, a journeyman. Correct. That's what I was looking for. Thank you. He, he's a journeyman. He hasn't stayed other than his one head coaching position at Duke and, and Georgia tech, who's his alma mater. He has been, he stays one, two years every school, but he obviously is experienced. He's a veteran. He's, he's coached with coach Malzahn before at, at Auburn. Um, and I'm curious to see is he's obviously everyone knows you see biggest problem is stopping the run and he's harped on that. And I want to hear, is it just speak? Is he just saying that? Cause he knows that's what all the fans and basically what he was brought here to do. Uh, or is it true? Um, did, did his, did his, does his coaching philosophy and his, his strategy and his X's and O's, um, do they get to the point where UCF has a reliable run stop because it was just atrocious last year it was bottom 10 in the country and, and, and uh, the absolute dead last in the big 12 without being able to stop the run. Um, the, it, it's not going to matter if the secondary is great. You know what I mean? So for me, that's going to be, I think goes hand in hand with the line, you know, with everything I said, but I, that probably is really the number one thing I'm looking for out of camp. Do, do guys start having some quotes? Yeah. The run stop is looking better. The scheme is looking better for it guys. We've really focused on, you know, uh, the fundamentals of tackling, which is something that was mentioned today by Gus. So uh, I want to see it in, in action, but you, you do start to see the quotes in camp. They provide little breadcrumbs if, if that's going to be uh, something that we're going to be able to rely on uh, during the season. Yeah, I mean, let, let's be real. Ted Roof is the hard-nosed guy uh, who, you know, that's what he was brought in to do, help with the fundamentals, make sure it was mm -hmm. tackling, make sure we're more aggressive on defense. And the mantra from day one in the offseason, um, you know, was stopping the run. I mean, at the at the last press conference of the season that Gus talked about, he talked about stopping the run. All offseason, we've seen that. We've seen a change in personnel. To be frank, last year, we had a pretty good defensive back uh, room with pretty good results. What we couldn't do was stop the run. We were dead last in the uh, Big 12 
in the yards per uh, carry, um, you know, defensively. So, yeah, you know, you, you think, okay, well, you've got Oliver in in the uh, in the in the Big Twelve, and we played Oliver. Well, guess what? They shut Oliver down. So it wasn't Oliver who threw off our numbers. It was Kansas who had uh, crazy numbers. And yes, Jaden Daniels was uh, phenomenal as a running quarterback. But at the same time, uh, Kansas State hurt us with that. Uh, and they've got a new quarterback this year that we saw a little bit of uh, towards the end of the last game. That's going to be that same guy, big, strong guy who likes to run. So again, we've got to be able to contain. That's one thing we missed on the edges. We had pretty good edge rushers, uh, but they missed containment. There were people out of place. Um, and, you know, we didn't have the the size. There was a lot of um, there was a, a lot of uh, yards after contact last season. If you watched it, uh, every time our safety came up, um, you know, I was I was concerned he was going to bounce off the player that was coming at him. So the part of that is size. Part of that is technique. Part of that is aggressive. Part of that is, um, you know, flexibility in the type of defense that you're playing. We're going to play hard-nosed uh, defensive football. You're going to see different schemes this year. You're going to see a 3-5 front, right? So a 3 front with five, uh, you know, quote-unquote um, linebackers and defensive backs. You're going to see that type of containment type of defense when it comes to – be because we're trying to disguise blitzes. That defense specifically – uh, that that defense specifically is designed to be able to introduce exotic blitzes. So what I am looking to see out of camp uh, defensively, agree on the linebackers, but I think I, I honestly think we're good there, and I think we've got some depth there. I'm more comfortable with the linebackers this year and less worried about them. I'm um, I'm comfortable with our, our our tackles, Lee Hunter and John Walker, barring anything bad happening i think those two are going to be a menace and we do have some depth there as well the edge rushers i think we've got some good depth on the edge um so i expect a lot out of this defense and defensive backs we've got a plethora of options as you mentioned uh but we have a lot of guys and i don't know if you know that notice this we have a lot of guys that have played multiple spots tennyson who i mentioned earlier is a perfect example of that he played multiple spots you've got pace who can play linebacker or he can play safety. Um, so we've got a lot of flexibility in the players who they're not just a cornerback. You know, they're not just a nickel or knight, as we like to call it, right? They're not just a linebacker. They're playing multiple positions. So I expect us to have exotic blitzes. Um, and, you know, the big thing for me is, is the communication that I'll be looking for is, have they got the communication down? The middle linebacker position and the safety position, you know, those guys have to communicate really well to the other guys when they're making their reads. And especially if you've got exotic blitzes that are coming on, there's going to be options there depending on what the offense gives them. So they're going to have to be able to communicate effectively, read what the offense is doing, and make sure that they're sending the right guy. Otherwise, you've got a mismatch on the line and they're going to go for big yards. So that's what I'm going to be looking for primarily is, you know, is the communication in the defensive backfield and uh, the linebackers, is that going to be good enough? I do think we have a good enough front four, quote unquote, four, right, to be able to stop pretty much and run stuff. And they did a pretty good job last season. But is the help going to be there? Do the linebackers know where to scrape? A lot of times our linebackers were scraping incorrectly, hitting the wrong hole, and that's why they were going for big games, uh, big gains. So can those players that have come together, do they, A, have the mental toughness? Do they have that attitude? Are we seeing that coming out of camp? B, is Ted Roof uh, going to be able to install an aggressive enough defense that allows which is why i think we went senior junior and senior heavy is do we do those guys get comfortable in the system fast enough that they can play without thinking and you're more likely to have that happen with seasoned guys that are coming in can we stop the run because i i have i have all the confidence brandon adams is a shutdown corner 
If you look at his uh, stats from last year, that guy is a guy with the size and uh, the capability to, you know, basically shut down half of the field or at least a quarter of the field. So, um, and he will be, I think, an NFL draftee. Where he gets drafted, I don't know. That depends on how well he does this season, but there was even noise last season about him. Um, and I, I think we've got a lot of guys. I mean, you, you, you think about the Cincinnati guys that came in, both of them, Byron Threats and Pace, were disruptive last year and really, really good players, the best players on Cincy's team. Can we effectively utilize uh, these guys in a way with a scheme that's not vanilla um, that we can confuse offenses? Because I think that's the big thing we were missing. We were playing more traditional base defenses, and offenses could read that. They uh, they set up their – the quarterbacks set up their blocks uh, appropriately, and they, flood, they flooded the field for mismatches. We saw that with Kansas – Kansas State constantly, the linebackers were not scraping, not fast enough, and we weren't keeping edge contained. Um, so I think we can plug up the A gap and B gap. Can the linebackers come back when those guys are blocked down uh, by the offensive line to clean up the running back? So that's that's what I'm looking for. Um, and a lot of that's going to be, I, I think, I think um, Ted Roof has a lot of options as who's he, who he's going to play and where. So it'll be really, really interesting to see who lines up where. But I expect us to rotate a bunch of guys for different looks to bring them downhill at different times with the different skill sets that they have. So I expect a lot of rotations, which means a fresher defense, which means you're not going to be worn down as the game proceeds. If someone's just playing SEC style, um, you know, wear you down. Uh, running game, which is what we saw last season and was also different than what the Big 12 has traditionally played all the way throughout. Whether you're talking about Oklahoma, which is normally airing it out, they have Dylan Gabriel, one of the best pure passers uh, that I've seen in a really long time. Uh, but he wasn't passing the ball. They were trying to run the ball. So defensively, I think that that's what I'm going to be looking out for is attitude, who's playing, and what does the scheme look like. And they're not going to show us everything, obviously. But are we playing multiple schemes instead of just the traditional uh, schemes when we're setting up in scrimmage? So uh, we will have some folks that will be on the sidelines for scrimmages and for practices, not just the 20-minute tune-up drill where everybody's stretching, right? Um, so we'll, we will have some insights as far as that's concerned as we progress along. All right, last thing um, before we get to your um, oxymoronic stat of the week Uh the special teams, what are you looking for out of preseason camp for special teams? Because I think that was a huge weakness in our game last year that caused us to do things that were not as high percentage because we didn't trust our special teams. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. I mean, obviously, there's no bigger storyline than Colton Boomer, um, it, you know, is – is he going to get back to how he was freshman year? I mean, Roger, you talked about this last year that he had, you know, dead leg. He was obviously someone that not only obviously handled field goal kicking duties, but also was the kickoff specialist. Um, a guy that, you know, going from missing only one field goal his entire freshman season, missed five or six last year, and some of them chip shots, you know, 30, 35 yards out. He went from, you know, after the disaster that we had in Daniel Barsky going back, going to Colton Boomer was a revelation. I mean, especially at UCF. I mean, we've had, you know, it's another one of those positions. We've had some really reliable guys in the last decade, whether it was Matty Wright or uh, Dylan Barnes or whoever the case was, we've always had guys that have been very, very reliable place kickers. And that's what we got back to in 2022. Then last season, um, it kind of fell apart. So I think that's the number one thing is, is he, and you'll know that in camp is, is, I mean, that's something that comes out, I think a lot more than how the quarterback is doing, for example, is, is he, is he making his, you know, kicks? I mean, obviously in practice and game situations are very, very different, but is he a guy that is going to be reliable again? Um, you know, I think there's a lot of kind of, you know, uh, the mental that goes into this is, is, is that, did he fit, get that fixed? Cause I don't think he just, you know, got space jammed and lost his talent here. Uh, you know, he may have had some injuries or whatever the case may be, but 
if you know a guy that can hit a 50 yard field goal the entire season and missed one field goal that guy's in there somewhere so is he going to get back to it if not well we apparently I, I don't you know i know kicking rankings are i don't know how legitimate we are but apparently we got the number one kicker in the country um in last year's recruiting class who is on the team now so we do have someone there potentially if if Boomer uh, is not making, I think it's still his job to lose, but that's something I'm really looking at. How does he look in camp? And then do we have someone take over, um, you know, kickoff duties? Um, because so we avoid that problem of him kind of getting worn out. And we've seen that in years past where there has been um, different, you know, two different players for that, a, a kickoff specialist and then a place kicker for field goals. So I think that to me is, is the number one uh, thing by far, and then, you know, Mitch McCarthy, same thing. He kind of a little bit of a fall off last year. So it'll be interesting to see how, how he looks at, at punter. Um, and then, you know, uh, it's always interesting to see who is uh, the punt returner, who is the kick returner. You know, last year they experimented, obviously, Xavier Townsend. We know he's the punt returner. He's already gotten a lot of preseason accolades, uh, been on multiple watch lists, and um, obviously all the – media um you know honorable mentions for special teams so we know he's going to be the punt returner but who's going to be the kick returner ucf tried out multiple guys if i recall i think johnny richardson may have been on some of them i think one of the dbs was on uh one of them last year so it'd be interesting to see who kind of establishes um themselves as, as the kick returner i think it was like amari johnson may have been one of them now he's obviously transferred so uh it'll be interesting to see who um emerges there but to me i'm really looking at it is Boomer still that guy? Uh, I, I'm not someone that is ready to give up on him because I, I do think what I saw freshman year looked like he had he had the moxie, and then even um, even last season, um, you know, he started out strong. He nailed the game-winning field goal against Boise State on the road as time expired. So it, you know, it wasn't like it was all bad last year. So that to me is the number one thing that I'm really looking to see out of out of camp. Yeah, I, I'd agree. I, I think the kicker situation will be interesting. I, you know, last last season, Gus gave Boomer every opportunity that he could. Sure. Um, I think Gus supported him. I think he tried to give him, you know, the the confidence that he needed when things were going sideways. Um, up until the last game. And I, and I honestly, I think that hurt us a couple of times, um, you know, in those close game situations, uh, Colton Boomer, he, it's going to be really interesting to see how he performs in camp. Um, and I think that, you know, during the week, I think he was kicking just fine because if he wasn't kicking just fine, why did Gus trot him out there for those field goal tries? You know, he must have been doing something right, um, you know, during the week. So it'll be really, really interesting to see if he's our starting kicker. I don't know if he will be. Uh, as you mentioned, we've got some competition in the locker room for the starting kicker position. Um, he dead legged. So I do think that was part of it last season. Uh, and you especially saw that because, you know, if he was doing OK during practice, but then got into those big game situations after he'd kicked several times for kickoffs, you know, and then he gets down there and kicks and, and I mean, uh, 25, 35 yard field goals. Colton Boomer kicks those all day, every day. That's when I knew something was wrong. You know what I mean? And, and yeah, he definitely had dead leg last season. In addition to that, um, I think he got in his headspace that, that moxie that, that, and for kickers, that's super important because it's just like bowling or golf kickers. It's all about consistency in your approach. And a lot of that has to do with repetitions and not thinking about that aspect of it. Right how how you're going to kick it while you're kicking it. And if you're doubting yourself or you've got that in your mind, that leads to misses because it's very, very easy uh, to be just off, especially when you're kicking against the wind or, you know, off one of the hashes or, you know, anything like that. So I, I think that's going to be the story. I, I do think we're going to see an improvement in our return uh, game. And, I, you know, for the from a punting perspective, 
we weren't really that bad as far as a, a punter was concerned. He was kicking 42 yards on average. And in addition to that, it's uh, a lot of it was rugby style. So it's not a traditional punt that you're going to punt for hang time like that. A lot of times rugby style kickers are going to, are going to punt and they're going to try uh, to get that punt to roll for the distance because they are kicking off balance per se. They, they're not lining up, have the ball and have a second to like really boot the ball. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to see. And they're trying to get it to roll as close to the, uh, end zone as they possibly can without crossing the goal line. So it'll be really interesting to see how that all works out. Um, but to me, I mean, the story of special teams is going to be the kicking game because it put us in really bad situations last year, several times in very, very close games. So that's it for that. Uh, let's go ahead and pivot. We'll talk some more as we go along. Next up, we've got a Allen's oxymoronic stat of the week. And of course you get the point this week versus, uh, Josh's sometimes funny fact of the week because he didn't show again. No, no call, no show this week. So uh, he should be back next week, folks. Um, Alan, what do you have for us this week? Ow. All right. So I went, um, I guess it's kind of random, but I just want to do a fun fact um, and went with the defense. Um, you know, I think if you're not, well, I guess maybe no longer is that random because we talked about it a lot on this show. We talked about, you know, the defense and the secondary hasn't been, um, you know, kind of up to par, uh, what we're used to seeing. So I want to take a look the last time that any individual, uh, DB or for any, any player really on defense for that matter has had more than four interceptions in one season. The last time was actually 2018 and it was Richie Grant with six. And then you have to go all the way back to 2013 for the next time that we had someone over four interceptions, uh, uh, which was uh, in 2013 um, when we had uh, Jacoby um, I'm Glenn. Drawing, yeah, Jacoby Glenn, who had eight interceptions. So only two times uh, in the last two years have we had anyone with over four interceptions. Uh, so it's interesting to kind of see that. I know, you know, obviously the interception numbers generally aren't high, but I think historically we've how, always had guys that are in the, you know, you know, five, six, seven. Um, so it's interesting to see that the last few years we've kind of actually, for the most part, actually been three or under, there's only been one year mixed in there where we had a guy with four. So really the better staff would actually been, uh, anyone over three interceptions. So, um, but interesting to see with all these transfers that we got, um, this year, can we, and in talking about being more of an aggressive defense, can we start to produce some more, some more turnovers in the secondary? That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, be nice to get back to ball hawking again. Right. And that goes back to the aggressive um, defensive style and playing that instead of trying to keep everybody in front of you that we've been playing lately. Right. So yep. um, it'll, it'll be interesting to see that also goes with scheme, right? Because if you're playing four down linemen, and you're aggressively trying to pursue or running off the edge, that gives you less guys in the backfield to be able to cover those receivers because you're betting on them. So their goal and their job is to keep the play in front of them to reduce the total number of yards if they do make the completion, right? Um, so I think, uh, you know, if you, if you have, um, you know, that five middle on that defense. So you got three down linemen and five in the middle that gives you the option to both either rush the ball or be aggressive depending on the play and disguising that uh, defensive play based on what the offense is doing. So that should equate to more interceptions this year. And that's what I'm expecting as well. All right, real quick, let's go ahead and pivot. pivot. Um, there it is. All right. Listener love. I wanted to talk a little listener love this week. Um, shout out to UCF alum, the night UCF, Connor Redman, Trevor Thorpe, Tanvir Hussein, and Ray Dog 892,000. Um, <laughs> thank you for joining us uh, and following us. And, um, you know, let's uh, continue to keep the follow train going. Tell your friends, let's keep it going. Uh, we appreciate 
everybody who joins us on this crazy ride. Of course, always remember that we're open um, for uh, you know recommendations or feedback, et cetera. We'll have some more detailed stuff that you're more used to hearing. The off season is finally coming to the end. One of the hallmarks of this show is you've got former players on it. Uh, so you're going to be hearing uh, a lot of very, very specific things, and that'll carry out throughout the season. So excited for football season. Uh, excited to have you guys with us. Go Knights and charge on. Charge on, baby. Wow, that, that was delayed, Alan. I, I don't know.